All right, good morning. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, October 6th, 2022 uh, Des Moines Area Metropolitan Planning Organization uh, Transportation Technical Committee. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting uh, October 6th, 2022 meeting to order. Uh, and first, we'll start off with uh, a vote of the approval of the agenda. Can you get a motion, please? Motion to approve the agenda, Houston. Second, Rudy. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, and again, we are doing this meeting online, so we will not have everyone unmute and say aye. We'll just ask anyone opposed to uh, opposed to approving uh, speak up and opposed. So let's. Uh, is there any uh, discussion on the agenda? Anyone opposed? Okay, hearing none, the agenda has been approved. Uh, thank you, Tracy, for sending that out. Uh, item three is a, a, a vote that we'll take a vote, approval of the meeting of minutes. Uh, can I get a motion and a second, please? Motion to approve the meeting minutes from September, Huseman. Thank you. Second, Rudy. Thank you so much. It's been uh, moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Anyone opposed? Hearing none, we'll consider the September meeting minutes uh, approved. Uh, thank you, Tracy, as well, for, get, for getting those put together and, and sent out. All right, item four, uh, we have a presentation uh, looking for, uh, for by Allison here on the rain campaign update. Allison? Well, unfortunately, you won't hear me present, but we did invite oh. Kathy Drool, who is the new um, watershed cord, watershed resources, Outreach Coordinator um, for Polk County, who's been leading our rain campaign efforts um, to give us an update on what's going on there. So Kathy, do let us know if you have any issues with sharing your screen or um, any other technical pieces. Sounds good. Hi everyone, I'm Cassie. I've met uh, quite a few of you in person and I've been the Water Resources Outreach Coordinator for about four months. And um, I was hired as um, a goal of the rain campaign to um, expand uh, the outreach opportunities and kind of uh, grow the campaign a little bit more than uh, the current uh, rain campaign committee could uh, devote to because they all have full-time jobs doing a lot of other things. And so um, I'm excited to be here. I've had a great time so far uh, in this position and I will share a little bit about what we've been doing this year with the rain campaign. All right, so let me share my slideshow. Okay, everyone can see my slideshow? Yes, yep. thank you, Cassie. Okay, great. So uh, if you haven't visited the website, raincampaign.org, uh, it's a great resource uh, for uh, citizens across the Metro to see which communities uh, participate in the cost share programs for uh, practices like rain barrels and rain gardens, soil quality restoration, that sort of thing. It also just gives a great uh, general overview of the benefits of these types of practices. So uh, 2022 updates, uh, new staff is me. <laughs> so um, I'm working on rain campaign things, as well as assisting um, John Swanson with Polk County Public Works with some of the Watershed Management Authority duties, uh, working with Allison on that as well, and a lot of other uh, administrative uh, behind the scenes sort of things uh, to help uh, with uh, not only external communication to uh, everyday citizens, but also um, helping with internal communication between uh, communities and uh, WMAs to make sure that everyone knows what's going on and can uh, share ideas and uh, new projects. Cassie, I'm going to stop you just for a second. And sure. you're not advancing slides at this point. So why don't you try the presentation mode again? Oh, thank you. Sorry. You're fine. All right, you see that now? Does that advance? We're still seeing, and somebody else can chime in if they see something else. But on my screen, I still see your PowerPoint, like the full. Yeah, Cassie, you might be showing the editor view as opposed to the uh, oh. slideshow view. Let me share it again then.
Now are you seeing the slides advance? No, it's maybe still I'll it, stop, Maybe I'll stop sharing and try sharing again. Okay. Much better. Good. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, also, uh, I made a few website updates. Uh, nothing major because uh, it's a, it's already uh, has a lot of great information on there. Um, I'll talk about some of the uh, events that we've taken the the rain campaign uh, artwork to, and um, also uh, give an update on the number of projects that's been installed in the metro, along with some special projects. So with the website update, like I said, if you haven't visited before, it's raincampaign.org. Um, I did create some new YouTube videos for rain barrels and rain gardens. And um, maybe you have seen, uh, there was a soil quality restoration one that was completed, um, I think a couple of years ago. And so I tried to do it in the same style as the, um, the other ones. And it highlights uh, the benefits of the project and, uh, just, you know, everyone likes YouTube videos. So it's just a, a nice, easy way to get the message out in an entertaining way. Um, I also uh, rearranged some of the text and the website just to shorten the census for a clearer message and also bring the mission statement up to the top of the website uh, to just kind of clean things up a little bit. But like I said, I don't feel like there was a whole lot of updates I needed to make besides uh, updating the numbers for the BMPs that were done in the last fiscal year. Um, I updated the contact information uh, to me. And also, uh, Polk City is a new participant in the cost share program. So we added uh, their information as well. They have um, expanded their uh, program for, uh, they did a, a large soil quality restoration uh, program uh, last year. And now they are expanding the program to include um, several other BMPs, including rain barrels and rain gardens and soil quality restoration. I did include one of my videos and I have no idea if it's gonna work or not, but we'll give it a try. And if it doesn't work, I'll move along. Let me make sure I share my audio too. Can everyone hear that okay? Yeah. yeah. If anyone has ideas for any other BMPs that you'd like me to make a little video for, this is pretty easy to do. We put this in because uh, anytime we had any measurable rain, uh, this back area would pond uh, rather heavily. And we're also at the end of the street. And so all the water from the neighborhood also comes kind of down here as well. So my favorite is the dry stream bed, how it goes with the rest of the landscaping that we've had done. Um, it's not intrusive into our yard, in my opinion. It goes well with what the other things that we have going on in our yard. Um, so, and then the second favorite thing is all the plants. I just, I'm really excited to, for next spring to see um, what comes up and what flowers in the different seasons and then to see them spread and uh, fill in even a little bit more. Yeah, if anyone else has any ideas for a video um, that uh, you feel like would be helpful for the rain campaign or um, getting the message out about these programs, I'm always open to new ideas. Uh, I have the goal to make a cute little video like this for all the different types of um, practices that uh, residents can install in their yards. So we did uh, repaint the sculptures this year. Um, John Swanson's mother-in-law is a, an accomplished artist. And so she painted prairie flowers on the rain uh, coat base to make it look less cheese-like. 
And then we also gave the umbrella a nice fresh coat of paint too. So they've been making the rounds over the last couple of weeks. Uh, they went to, or a couple of months, they went to the Iowa State Fair and they saw over 130,000 visitors. Also, we took that to the Glow Wild event at Polk County Conservations uh, at Jester Park. They saw 1,100 visitors there, and then they just got back from the Ames Eco Fair where they saw over 700 visitors. I also, um, my husband made this cool root box where um, there are holes drilled at the bottom of that box. I don't know if you can see very well, but there's string there. And I measured the string to different lengths of different prairie plant roots. And so it's really fun for people of all ages to pull those strings and their jaw just drops when they see how long some of the roots are of those prairie plants. And then I also have Kentucky bluegrass, which is like just a few inches long. So it's a really great visual. We also um, partnered with the Soil and Water uh, District uh, to get the stream trailer out. So a stream trailer is basically a big sandbox that is hooked up to um, water. And so as the water flows downhill, it creates gullies uh, that are similar to um, what creeks do um, on the land. And so it's a great uh, exercise in erosion. And then people can use uh, little tools uh, to uh, straighten the stream or create uh, stabilization for the stream, it's neat. Um, I also uh, created a, an instruction manual and a YouTube uh, instructional video for anyone who wants to borrow this equipment because currently, um, if anyone wants it, uh, John Swanson has to be available with this truck and we have to be available to take it to the site and assemble it. But the goal is hopefully we will be able to present this uh, manual to anyone that wants it. And if they have a trailer hitch, they can pick it up and they know exactly how to assemble it and take it down. Um, Ames did this uh, without our assistance for their eco fair and they said it went well. So we're hoping this is a great way for um, these to get used more. Also, um, we're continuing to grow and expand the number of BMPs installed in the Metro. So the grand total for fiscal year 22 was 379 practices. That's up, I, not much, but up at least um, five or six from the previous year. And as you can see, rain barrels um, and soil quality restoration are still the top uh, two, um, the easiest things that uh, people can do in their yards. And um, we're hoping uh, in the coming years to um, advertise even more how easy it is for people to do soil quality restoration and install rain barrels to um, help with water quality in their yards. And then obviously uh, from there, hopefully they'll move on to some more uh, intensive practices. So some special projects. Um, I did create some signage for the Grimes Kenny Brook Park Wetland Project. So if you uh, visit that wetland, uh, they have three interpretive panels and uh, I designed some signs for those to explain uh, how the wetland works. Um, also, Clive did their citywide soil quality restoration program this summer, where they have um, treated over 100 yards. So um, in each of those yards, we uh, created, I designed some signs, and they uh, were the foam core ones that we could put in yards so that as people drove around, they could see, um, you know, they would see why is this yard covered in compost, and then the, the sign can explain what the process is. Also, I worked with Cody, the Easter Lake Watershed Coordinator to create some cool stickers. So that little raindrop in the middle is a sticker that we're printing and sharing at events. Also, I just made this I Heart Clean Water bumper sticker that we're gonna order for anyone that wants one. And then also I'm creating these tools of the month that I'm going to share with cities in the Metro um, for them to either share on their social media or in their newsletters. Um, or um, any other way that they want to get the word out about these practices, maybe a utility mailer. So um, down in the right hand uh, bottom corner, there is an example of a Facebook post that I had created that um, cities can share. So there's a different theme every month. So um, September was rain barrels, October is watersheds. So um, some of you have, uh, I've shared these items with. So um, hopefully uh, if you follow the rain campaign page or any of the city pages, you'll see more of these types of posts on those pages. And that's all I had. Are there any questions? Hey Cassie, I don't, and maybe this is a question for our Polk City folks, but I don't, uh, I noticed that the, on the table that looks like Polk City had 63 soil quality restorations. Uh, um, 
yep. last year was there was there something that was done to have that good a participation i mean that's that's pretty impressive yes. participation for um, um yes that was um in partnership with the uh water quality initiative grant with idols um they received funding from the state to um do a cost share program um for uh so quality restoration it was a citywide program similar to what clive did this year excellent okay excellent. and i also want to thank you it looks like if, if you know if you go on the rain campaign website there are links to also the individual our individual cities programs mm -hmm. for the rebates so so thank you cassie and team for putting that are there are there any other questions for for cassie okay here none cassie thank you so much excellent work so th thank you so much for for sharing this information thank you thanks for having me yeah okay all right, well, that takes us to item five, uh, report an optional vote on the model ordinance regulating bicycles and personal transportation devices. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, to Aspen. Aspen? Thanks, we'll wait for my slides to catch up here. All right, so um, as we discussed last month, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Roundtable um, has worked really hard the last eight or nine months um, to put together another iteration of a model bicycle ordinance um, for the MPO to consider um, approving to then take to our local jurisdictions and hopefully have some folks adopt just to make sure that in our region, um, you know, we have a lot of cyclists that the rules um, and, and sort of predictive things that you can anticipate driving to and from communities um, are going to you know, have some regional consistency with them. Um, next slide. Um, and so again, this was developed in partnership with uh, the Bike Ped Roundtable. Um, it's generic so that communities may use it as just a guidepost um, to look at their own city ordinances and see sort of what sort of changes apply to their current context, um, but then also get up to speed on, you know, just existing best practices um, uh, in our nation. So. Um, we believe that it is consistent with the code of Iowa, so we shouldn't have any issues there. Um, and again, this is just supposed to clarify those historical points of conflict between vehicular and non-vehicular road users, so we don't have as much gray area. And again, because in our metro region, so many of our popular bike routes and trails go from community to community, having some sort of consistency um, is best and so having the MPO be the leader on this and, and put together a model ordinance for communities to work with, uh, we thought was the best route forward. And also this ordinance does further all four goals in our long range transportation plan mobilizing tomorrow. Next slide. So again, um, I'm not gonna rehash all of this. Again, I discussed why a model ordinance, why now and, and why bicycles and personal transportation devices were included in it. Again, it just seems like it's you know a good time to bring this up again. Um, and also the reason why we wanted to do an ordinance is because it, it does three things. It regulates the operation, it educates drivers and operators of bicycles and personal transportation devices, and it coordinates our region a little bit better um, in terms of transportation. And also it's a transportation solution that doesn't require construction or funding um, that helps with the optimization of our system and its safety. And because personal transportation devices, which is our term for things like personally owned e-scooters, one wheels. Um, we wanted to address those so that communities who are ready to address those may do so with this ordinance. But again, because it's a model, communities can choose to revise it as needed. Next slide. So the primary chapters are here. We have purpose, definition, scope of regulations, and so on and so forth. Um, we do not address micro mobility here. So this is not a shared scooter program, um, but we do include e-bikes because the Iowa legislature has defined what those are. Um, but we also don't address pedicabs in this ordinance. But again, if your city would like to, you can go ahead and add those. Next slide. And so the primary components in this model um, that are different from current city's ordinances regarding bicycles is again, it, it includes personal transportation devices. It updates some definitions. 
Um, and then these are the other provisions we have. Last month, I went into a little bit greater detail about the change lanes to pass, three feet lateral passing distance, as well as the dead red light allowance. Now that you've had a month to review this and hopefully talk to some of your other city staff or executive or policy committee members, if anyone has any additional questions about this, um, I would be happy to take those now. Thank you, Aspen. Uh, and, and thank you to the folks uh, that have helped put a lot of work to putting this together. Uh, and I also see uh, Jeff and Mindy, thank you so much uh, for your work as well. Are there any questions for, for Aspen? All right, well then I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. And this is my final one on this. Um, so with the discussions from last month, it was recommended that the MPO's legal counsel reviewed the ordinance um, a little bit more closely to be sure that the current language is in fact consistent with state code. Um, and I talked with uh, Scott Brennan earlier this week and he said, from what he can determine, everything seems right in line with state code. Um, however, what local jurisdictions might be wary of and what local law enforcement agencies might be wary of is if it's, in, if it's consistent with their city code. We did not review every city code in our jurisdiction. We just focused on state code. And so if your community decides to, um, you know, discuss this uh, for local adoption, you will certainly have to do a more thorough review of your own city ordinances to make sure that the model ordinance language is consistent and then revise it from there. But in terms of being consistent with state code, everything that we've outlined seems to be all right. Um, and so if you have exec or policy members, again, who have expressed concerns about this, again, it's something we're still reviewing, but from our review thus far, it seems like it's all right. So with that, I would recommend approval of the model ordinance draft language. And again, this is just saying that we, the MPO, think that these are good provisions to look at um, a little bit more closely in your cities um, and hope for some, some regional adoption of this. Um, it does not mean that this is now the law of our region or anything like that. Um, it, it just is things that we think that we can, again, get up to speed on in our state um, and in our, in our area. Thank you, Aspen. Uh, is there a motion in a second to uh, approve this the model ordinance for bicycles and personal transportation devices? Steve, I'll, I'll, I'll move uh, so at least we can have any additional discussion. Okay, thank you. The motion's been moved. Do I have second. a second? Second, Thank you, Chelsea. All right, it's been moved and, and seconded. Uh, and we'd like to open it up for discussion, please. Is there any discussion on the model ordinance? Okay, uh, hearing none, is anyone opposed uh, to approving uh, this model ordinance? All right, hearing none, we'll consider the, uh, the model ordinance approved. Uh, thank you, Aspen. All right, Thanks. next uh, we have a item six, a report and optional vote on the fiscal year 2023-2026 transportation improvement program amendment. Uh, and that's uh, Aspen, you take that one as well? Yeah, thank you. Um, so as of October 1st, um, the statewide transportation improvement program is now in effect. And so we can go ahead and make changes um, uh, since we approved our tip back in July. And so we have 
three to consider today. Um, one is coming from DART, one is from the city of Des Moines, and one is from the DOT. Um, and these are just amendments. Next slide. So DART would like to um, add a project, um, $30,000 in STBG funds um, for the purchase of B-cycles um, and their installation. Um, again, they already have this money, um, but they just need to um, add this project to our current TIP. Um, they've already been awarded this, but they're adding it uh, for the year 2023 rather than 2026. Next slide. The second one is from the city of Des Moines. Um, I had originally changed their funding um, to STBG federal aid rather than swap STBG funds. Again, as you might recall, I think back in June, we discussed that the DOT was having some um, changes with swap funds. And so things that weren't let by the November letting needed to be converted to federal aid. Or so I thought it turns out that's not until February. So this is just kind of um, fixing that um, funding mistake that I made by having it as federal aid rather than swap. It will still be swap dollars though. Next slide. And our last one is from the DOT, um, a, a project that they have out in Warren County, a pavement project on Iowa 28. Um, they're revising um, the length of that project, but they're, to my surprise, there's not gonna be a change in the cost even though the project's a little bit longer now. Um, and so those are the three amendments we have. Um, I would recommend approval. Okay, thank you, Aspen. Uh, looking for a motion and a second uh, for approval of these amendments. Move to approve, Davis. Thank you, John. A second? Second, Huseman. Thank you, Chelsea. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none, we'll consider those amendments approved. Thank you, Aspen. Thanks. Okay, it takes us to item seven, a report on adopting Justin, Justice 40 initiative metrics. Uh, Allison? Yes, this time you will get to hear from me. So back in January, 2021, um, the Biden administration announced their Justice 40 initiative. There's some information here um, about that, but really they want to make sure that we're investing in underinvested and disadvantaged communities with our federal dollars. Um, and so each of the agencies within the federal government were able to decide how they were going to adopt this and bring this into their folds. Um, and so USDOT decided that to address gaps in transportation infrastructure and public services by working towards the goal that many of our grant programs initiatives allocate at least 40% of benefits of, from federal investments to disadvantaged communities. And that this is not a one-time investment, but a series of changes um, that will be implemented across the department. Because of this, um, and a lot of the programs that are coming out, we did want to bring this to you as a discussion um, between whether the MPO staff should start developing our next edition of the um, Environmental Justice Report, or if we should streamline this with the Justice 40 initiative um, and their mapping. Um, one of the things to keep in mind as I kind of run through this is that there are a number of different USDOT funding programs. You can see here, this is not the laundry list, but these are some of the things that um, I know people are already starting to look at um, that will use that Justice 40 initiative as its metric. And so that's just something to keep in mind um, as I walk through this. Next slide. So just to kind of reiterate um, and refresh people's memory, so the Des Moines Area MPO's environmental justice map is there on the right from 2021. Um, we use seven degrees of disadvantage, which you see there on the left, um, households in poverty, single head of household with children, persons with disability and so on. Um, and in this 2021 update, uh, the policy committee here at the MPO decided to set a control of a 70% threshold. Um, we used to use the regional average as a threshold. Now we bump that up to really hone in on some of those um, the top disadvantaged communities. You can go on to the next one. So now thinking about Justice 40 and that piece, uh, Justice 40 is much more of an integrated approach to examining what a disadvantaged community is, where it is, what the impacts and things like that are, um, and what metrics to use. So um, I've listed out a handful. Well, these are the 
both um, subject areas that they're in. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples of what metrics come underneath these. Um, so for climate change, it's things like population loss rates, um, agricultural loss or building losses um, under clean energy. It's you know the particular matter 2.5 in the air. Um, we get into clean transit. It's that traffic proximity and volume. Um, and you know as we kind of keep going down these lines, um, really a lot of it is not necessarily data that we um, here at the MTO typically pull, um, but we are able to integrate these in. Um, and so before we um, set out on finalizing our passenger transportation plan, the interconnect plan, um, working through our STBG scoring and things like that, um, we wanted to bring this to you. So some of the things um, are controlled here as well within this methodology. So um, within Justice 40, there's if, ors and ands. Um, and so for each of these subject areas on the left, there's an if, there's an or, and there's an and. So for the ifs and ors, they're underneath each of these, there's two to three metrics um, that you, if you have one of these or accumulation of these at or above the 90th percentile for those pieces, then um, you move on to the next one. You also, once you meet that if um, threshold, and for each of these, you need to be at or above the 60th percentile for low income and um, more than 80% of individuals 15 or older not enrolled in higher education. There is one outlier here, um, and that is the training and workforce development down at the bottom. Um, so within that category, their and is not necessarily about income um, and higher education. It's really about high school diploma and attainment there. Um, as well as that 80% um, within uh, higher education. Um, and so just wanted to kind of bring this to you all um, and discuss these metrics and kind of how they change. You can go to the next slide, Gunnar, and show you that, so this is the final map. So using the, um, the online portal for this, this is the map, and I'm sorry that we haven't made a shape file, but you can see the light blue areas there are what they deem um, at the federal level through the Justice 40 initiative as census tracts um, of disadvantage. So this, um, if, if we were to adopt Justice 40, this map and then pre, um, preceding maps after this would be along those lines. If you go to the next slide, I believe we get a comparison. Um, and so you can see a comparison between the two. There are some areas that fall off. So um, the apartment district near Valley High School in West Des Moines falls off. Um, up in Urbandale, um, some things fall off. But you also see areas come online. So um, east of 63rd and the Deer Ridge um, area and things like that, those come into the fold more. And so while there are some pushes and pulls here, um, nothing too drastic that we're really worried about from the MTO side. Um, but again, wanted to bring this to you. You can go on to the next slide. So just um, to summarize some of the similarities. So we, for the Environmental Justice Report, pull all of our data from the American Community Survey um, through the Census Bureau. Uh, the Justice 40 also uses federal level um, data sources, including American Community Survey, but also things like the National Risk Index. Um, you know, there's a, some modeling, toxic um, assessments and things like that that we don't necessarily work on in here. Um, also, there are some controls. So uh, because of how um, the over 65 population was adjusting the MPO environmental justice court a couple of years ago, we added that 70% threshold control in there. And there are, um, there are similarities uh, between those controls found in the Justice 40 as well. And then outcomes. So like we saw on that last map, um, really, you know, that urban core of Des Moines and then some of the outer line suburbs with smaller census tracts in there, um, those are represented, but there are those small tweaks and things like that that would come. Major differences, one with the environmental justice report, we really do, the, our degrees of disadvantage are very much transportation specific. So carless households, limited English, um, single head of household um, with children and looking at those pieces, whereas Justice 40 is an integrated um, metric. So they have um, all sorts of, they have the you know, proximity to traffic and the particulate matter, it brings in housing, it brings in economic development, um, and it really integrates these metrics and these planning areas into one thing. Um, and then the biggest difference would be 
the environmental justice report is developed in house um, where the justice 40 would be externally um, developed and we would then integrate that in. Um, so with that, it's a lot of information that I just kind of threw out to you. Um, I'd be interested in any questions or thoughts on the matter um, as we kind of move this forward. We, I'm quite indifferent. I would take suggestions on what works best for people um, in this, you know, a lot of people are looking at the different grant programs. So how this will impact um, your communities and your grant applications going forward is definitely a consideration. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them at this time. Allison, any questions for Allison? Hey, okay, hearing none, thank you for this information, Allison. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, takes us to item number eight, a report on the surface uh, from Zach on the surface transportation block grant scoring update. Zach? Yes, thank you. So following the last round of funding, the executive committee had requested that staff look into the scoring criteria. Um, this was really kind of driven by some concerns over project scoring low and then those projects being awarded and the the political ramifications of awarding low scoring projects. And so they wanted us to do a review of the scoring criteria. And so staff has spent the summer and the last few months uh, looking over the scoring criteria, the existing scoring criteria, kind of trying to evaluate um, why we're seeing lower scores and then also developing some new scoring criteria that might um, help alleviate those concerns. So one reason why or why we saw that the uh, current criteria was resulting in low scoring projects, I think, is probably due to the criteria being very locational based. And what I mean by that is that, you know, it focuses on certain areas, um, you know, for example, areas with poor pavement or areas that are located in an EJ area. If you're not in an EJ area, you automatically miss out on those points. Um, if you're not doing a project that's on um, a location with low or poor pavement, you're automatically missing out on those points. So there were a lot of um, there was a lot of criteria in the existing system that if you're not hitting those locations, you're just missing out on those points uh, completely. And that we feel like is really what's resulting in a lot of those lower scores, <clears throat> because historically, what we've seen is that a lot of the projects that are being submitted aren't really targeting those locations. So that's kind of what our review of the existing system showed. As I mentioned, staff had worked on developing some, some new criteria that we felt like might alleviate uh, this issue. And that's what we have shared in the agenda today. So there is a list of that new criteria in your agenda packet. And I will just kind of quickly um, go over uh, that new criteria that we're proposing to, as an alternative to the current system. Next slide, please. So with the proposed scoring criteria, uh, what we're trying to do is, as I mentioned, minimize the locational aspect of the existing scoring system and trying to focus more on treatments that can be done at any location um, throughout the metro that are going to still help address the goals in the long range plan. You know, so maybe just as an example, you know, instead of saying, is this project in an area with poor pavement, it would be focusing on things that each project can do to help make sure that the pavement lasts longer, for example. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I can kind of start digging into what some of the proposed criteria is. So we did keep the same four goal areas from long range plan that are in the current system. So the first one being transportation infrastructure and services are well managed and optimized. What we really tried to focus on here were, were two things. Um, ITS solutions from the national ITS uh, reference architecture that help um, improve traffic flow and congestion issues. And then also looking at some things that might help um, extend pavement life. You know, for example, the, the question in your packet for the pavement life focuses on things like you know, improved compaction and what kind of mixes are being used to help um, extend the life of the pavement. And we pulled this stuff from resources at the Federal Highway Administration. 
Um, the national or oh, the, the ITS questions focus on things like, you know, things that can be done, um, signal control and operation solutions from that uh, list of different ITS solutions, um, things that can be done for signal priority to help move traffic through, and then also looking at uh, traffic management operation solutions, uh, things like traffic surveillance, incident management systems, uh, regional traffic management, things like that. And all of these come from this list of ITS solutions. And so again, just trying to focus on things that um, any project could do anywhere in the Metro to help improve traffic flow and uh, the life of pavement without being so locational based. Um, next slide. On the enhanced multimodal transportation options, I would say that this is probably the, the least changed section um, from the current or from the existing uh, scoring system, but just trying to focus on things that each project can do to help improve multimodal facilities, um, streetscape and placemaking to help make the projects more accessible to pedestrians and comfortable for pedestrians. Um, you know, so for example, one of the questions in that section was looking at what kind of pro does the project include the following multimodal facilities and it lists off things like transit stops, uh, bike share stations, uh, share roads, bike routes, bicycle boulevards, paved shoulders, and also really just trying to hit on things that fall in different contexts. I think, you know, in our um, existing system, I mean, you could probably argue that a lot of the things listed in there probably were more focused on urban type areas. And so what I think we're trying to do with this new criteria is provide more of a list of or a menu of options that communities could include in their projects, whether it's a rural road or an urban road. You know, so for, for, so for example, we included that paved shoulder in there to provide a multimodal type facility that is more likely to be able to be put on a rural road um, when things like bike lanes really aren't feasible out on a rural road. So uh, just trying to provide more opportunity for um, projects to score and do things that help improve multimodal aspects. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, the third goal is improving the region's environmental health. Uh, so this one looks at basically um, strategies to help reduce the environmental impact of pavement. Uh, so just considering things of, you know, recycled materials, uh, um, reduce the distances that the materials that are going into the, the pavement are traveling, um, things of that nature. Again, this is all stuff that we researched and pulled off of uh, federal highway um, resources, um, including stormwater best managed practices. There's a question that has a big long list of various different stormwater BMPs that could be included in a project that would uh, allow it to score points under um, stormwater BMPs, um, reducing uh, transportation related emissions. So looking at things like electric vehicle infrastructure, alternative fuels, ways to reduce uh, VMT, and then just in general supporting a multimodal and mode um, shift are the kind of questions that we and criteria that we focused on in this category. Next slide, please. Uh, the final one is the health and safety and well-being of residents in the region. So this is very heavily safety focused. Um, we felt like sh shifting the criteria more towards a safety focus would probably be a good um, approach with a new scoring criteria. So we looked at various different things under this, um, the various different questions hit on things like um, speed management. So it could, you know, could score points if you're doing things like automatic, automated speed enforcement, um, using variable speed limits depending on weather or um, congestion, things like that. And then just general, you know, keeping the speed limit down as much as possible. Um, I think we all know that the higher the speed limit is, the more likely somebody's going to die if there's an accident. So the lower we can, if a street can do a lower speed limit, there's a likelihood that there's going to be less fatalities on that street. Um, the road departure safety elements, um, there's a question on that. So it looks at things like uh, wider edge lanes, safety edges. Again, things that we 
um, looked at and pulled from resources from the Federal Highway Administration. We really wanted to focus on things that have a proven track record of um, improving safety and reducing fatalities. And so that's kind of why we selected the things that we did um, for this updated criteria. Um, so rumble strips, meaning barriers, just things that there was evidence that have um, actually reduced um, fatalities on existing roads. Uh, also looked at intersection safety and things can be done at intersections to improve safety and then uh, pedestrian bicycle safety features um, as well within that question. So again, just trying to focus on things that that any project can do, no matter where you're at in the metro, that can improve safety. In the past, I think our criteria had focused on, you know, it asked a question related to, you know, are you located in an area with um, a high number of crashes or fatalities? And if you were, and you were doing certain things, you could receive points in that. But if you were not, then you kind of were just not able to even have a chance of scoring points for safety. Whereas the new criteria, the way it's structured, would allow you to score points in all the categories as long as you were doing some or several of the things within each one of those different uh, goal areas. Um, next slide. Another idea that we had, um, it's, this has not been completely fleshed out yet, um, but one thought we had is to have some more qualitative type questions to ask, things that focused on so that's hard to score technically, but you know areas that we wanted to maybe have some focus on, like economic vitality, um, quality of life, um, public engagement, things like that that are hard to gauge from a technical standpoint, but are more qualitative. And a thought that we had is that perhaps we could ask these questions and then have each member of the funding subcommittee score um, each project. Um, and then we would have a combined score basically from the funding subcommittee on the qualitative aspects of the project. Uh, we felt like that would do a couple of things. It would, it would bring the funding subcommittee more into the scoring process and uh, give them an opportunity to put, have more input in, in each one of the projects as well. Uh, next slide. So one thing I will point out here is that we have not assigned any points to any of this criteria yet. We really wanted to discuss the criteria with you first prior to starting to put points on it. Um, we felt if, like if we we put points in there from the beginning, it might just, the focus might be on points and where they're allocated and not on the criteria itself. So we wanted to have a discussion about the criteria first before we assign points. I think the other th important thing to reiterate about this updated scoring system is that you know, in, in many of these various different sections, we're seeing it as a, like I said, more of a menu of things you can select. So, you know, for example, if, let's just say on the safety one, uh, for example, if you, you could do multiple things under each one of those. And the way we're kind of looking at it right now is that there would be opportunity to score uh, multiple points under each one of those questions. And there would be some kind of a total amount of points that you could score under the safety section, for example, but you have a lot of different options of how to get to that total point amount, um, if that makes sense, as opposed to you either get the points for the question or you don't. Um, you know, you might, uh, you might not do any of the things under the speed management, but you might do a lot of the things under the roadway departure. And so you can make up points basically if you do a lot more of the safety features in those other categories, whereas if you're not doing, you know, something in one of the other ones. <clears throat> under the current system, if you don't do something under one of the categories, you're just missing out on those points, and there's no way for you to really uh, do anything to make those points up under any of the other categories. Uh, next slide. So we did share this out with uh, the Planning and Engineering Subcommittee. Uh, we have received, <clears throat> excuse me, some comments back, and these are some of the comments that we have received. Um, one comment or concern is that this criteria could be overly specific. You know, we're we're calling out very <clears throat> specific things that you can do to improve 
safety or pavement life or whatever. And <clears throat> based on the fact that a lot of projects are five years out when they apply for funding, maybe they the community has not uh, planned these things yet and they don't know if they're going to be doing these things. And so that could be a challenge with this updated scoring. <clears throat> there was also a concern that, you know, we're, you know, we don't really specifically call out congestion or level of service type issues. Again, this was intentional because of the locational nature of the past scoring system. You know, that's the kind of stuff we would look at in the past scoring system. And we kept running into this issue where projects were scoring low. They weren't really targeting uh, areas where there was congestion. For, for one thing, they're really, according to our metrics on congestion, there really isn't a lot of congestion happening in the metro. So we had that question on congestion and nobody was really scoring any points on it. Um, another concern is that it excludes elements like poor pavement, poor bridges, or high crash areas. So again, those are kind of those locational elements that we had had in the past scoring system. And what we were running into is that historically projects just weren't being submitted in those areas that were showing up as being high crash or poor pavement. You know, I did a quick uh, survey of all the projects over the last six years that have been submitted. And I think less than 20% of them had been submitted in areas that had poor pavement, for example. So that's a lot of projects that are missing out on even scoring points. Um, so I think, you know, the shift that we're, we're trying to make is, yeah, we're not specifically calling out poor pavement or high crash areas, but we are calling out things that every project could do to increase the life of their pavement or increase safety and reduce fatalities. And then oh, finally, another concern that was shared was just the timing of improvements. You know, the point that was made that is in a lot of the fringe areas of the metro, a new road might go in and they might not put in the sidewalks or the transit type elements until a later time, you know, when there's more development around that uh, new roadway. And so would those kind of projects be missing out on points uh, because they're not putting those things in right away? So those are some of the comments and concerns we've gotten so far. At this point, I know I've shared a lot of information at you all at once. Um, I do hope you had a chance to review some of this prior to the meeting, but I would open it up now if there's any discussion or concerns anybody has with what uh, we're proposing for new scoring criteria. Thank you, Zach. Is there any discussion or questions for Zach on this drafted criteria? Zach, I'm curious, was there was there feedback from the committee about about what was missing? I mean, I, clearly they felt like maybe the, the points were too narrowly focused, but was there was there something else in the kind of prioritization that was leading them in one direction that was inconsistent with the scoring? Um, to be honest with you, we haven't gotten a lot of feedback yet. Um, I've shared, you know, what I share on the screen there is pretty much everything that we've received on that. So we haven't really received anything in line with what you're um, referencing there. Yeah, because I'm asking because, you know, the, the third bullet here excludes the elements like poor payment, poor bridges, high crash areas, things that we've all clearly talked about are priorities. Yep. And so I guess my question is, are, are, if, if, if people feel that they're not, then that's a conversation to be had before those are excluded just because we're trying to exclude, or we're trying to move away from location-based criteria. Right, and I think, you know, that's one of the things we probably need to determine. Um, if we decide that we want to stick with those locational-based elements, then if projects are going to start scoring better, then communities are gonna to have to start submitting projects that actually line up with those areas. Um, if we keep the current locational based system and, and nothing changes as far as project submittal, then we're still going to see projects probably scoring lower than what the funding funding subcommittee would like to see. <clears throat> the idea here was those things are still important to us. We felt as a staff that payment condition and, and safety were still important that if we shifted towards a focus on things that every project could do to make sure they were improving those things, that might be a solution um, 
around it while still not losing out on the importance of poor pavement and, and crash locations safety. I see John, John Davis, you got your hand up. Yeah, Steve, uh, I guess I, 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 my comments right now is I haven't had a chance to sit down and review this. Uh, I think the email came out to uh, that I received was on Monday of this week in the afternoon. So I quite frankly haven't had a chance to spend some time with it. Just some of the things that uh, I saw in the with a really cursory review that I kind of wonder about is uh, one was uh, with regards to variable speed limits, um, is is that something that is authorized in the state of Iowa? Uh, my recollection, I haven't seen it, or I haven't come upon it in in Iowa, and I'm not sure how much you would do that outside of a um, more of a high speed environment, something above 35 or 40 miles an hour. Uh, those have been most of the applications that I've heard about or seen have been more interstate or highway type design. So I'm not sure if that would be something that we would wanna necessarily include. Um, so that, that'd that be just one initial feedback. And then the other that, that caught my eye was the echo traffic signal uh, control. I'm just kind of wondering what that is about. Because quite frankly, I like to think that I'm pretty up on traffic signal stuff, but I've not seen much in practice of that. So. Okay, so <clears throat> to your first question, I guess just in general, um, I will note that we're, we don't have any intent of rushing this scoring criteria through. I think the more that we uh, dug into it, the more it, it felt like to us that we were, it would be more of a process. Um, and we may have to uh, stick with our existing system uh, for this next funding round, uh, but we certainly want to continue to explore how we can improve the scoring system and so there's no rush on, uh, we're not trying to rush this through by any means. And we want to give people plenty of time to provide their comments and feedback on this uh, new criteria. Um, on the variable speed limits, again, we were pulling stuff from the Federal Highway Administration. They had a nice website that had a, a number of different uh, Basically, it was uh, treatments that can be done to improve safety. And so the variable speed limits was was focused on more of that higher speed corridor, as you mentioned. And that's partially what we're trying to do is make sure we have a scoring system that provides elements that a roadway within any area could still score points. I think one of the challenges with our existing system is that you could probably argue that in in a lot of cases, it is more focused on an urban type roadway. And so when a county would come in with a project, they always had a hard time uh, scoring very well on their projects. Um, suburban areas, I think, probably oftentimes had a harder time scoring well. And so trying to provide, as I mentioned before, like a menu of options that, you know, a variety of different contexts can still find something in that they can do to improve safety, to make sure their pavement life um, will last longer, to make sure they're doing things to help uh, support environmental type issues. So that was the that was the intent. You know whether or not we've hit that, I think, is to be determined. But um, on the eco traffic signal control, um, Z, are you on? Yes. Could you touch on that a little bit? I think that was one of the questions that you worked on. Yeah, that's just um, signal timing to kind of reduce idling. So um, from previous ICAP projects that were submitted, it kind of touches on, on um, similar practices as that. 
Okay. Uh, just one follow-up question. What uh, do you have a date that you desire to have comments back on on the the proposed changes or criteria? I think uh, I think we're hoping to be able to share feedback with exec next week. Um, so if people are able to look at this and provide comments prior to the executive committee, um, I think it would be beneficial for us to be able to at least share some initial uh, comments and reactions from the tech committee um, at exec next week. So if we could have comments by Tuesday of next week, that would that would allow us to incorporate those into our presentation to exec. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for Zach? This is Mark with the city of Ankeny, and I guess I'd just like to, uh, I guess, agree with the concern that's been raised about the criteria being overly specific. I mean, if you look at the does this project use any of the following strategies to extend the life of pavement? I mean, it's getting, to me, it's getting really in the weeds on how you design things and, you know, using polymers and improved compaction specifications. And, you know, I just, it just seems too prescriptive. And so I'll just kind of leave my comment at that. Thank you, Mark. Any other discussion or questions? So, Zach, we're we're asking the the committee to to review what you've included in the in the the agenda packet. Just those those criteria. Right? There's, um, just to, if any comments on that compared to what was what was scored last year uh, or used last year for criteria is that by next tuesday you said um if possible yes that would be that would be that would allow us to provide feedback to from you guys to um exec next week okay, okay. any other questions for zach Okay, hearing none, it will take takes us to item nine, a uh, report on upcoming events. I'll uh, we'll turn it over to Allison. Thank you. Um, one thing to bring to your attention, just next week, sorry, mid-October is the walk and roll to school day. Um, there's a handful of schools in the Metro that are doing this. Your community hasn't incorporated this. Feel free to check out walkbiketoschool.org. You can go on to the next one. Next week is also the APA Iowa chapter uh, planning conference down in Ottumwa. Um, registration is getting close to closing, but if you're not registered already, it's always a good conference and you'll see lots of us locals down there in a different town. Next, Growing Sustainable Communities is the next weekend um, over in Dubuque. I bring this one up um, because a lot of your cities are looking at, again, the integrated planning piece. And this is a great um, conference right here in the state of Iowa put on by the city of Dubuque. Um, and this year, uh, the RAIN campaign um, will be there presenting as well. Next. So instead of going through 15 slides of webinars, I put them on one. So just a couple of things. Um, obviously, most of you know that the Ohio chapter um, of APA has a really great planning webcast series. I just wanted to highlight some of the ones that are coming up because they're very re relevant to our Metro. So on the 19th, we have pretty policy for local EV infrastructure. Then we get into zoning um, for equity, resilience and post pandemic. And then the last one is really honing in on that um, urban flooding, which we just talked about with Brain Campaign. And that's on the 28th. I will go ahead and put in the chat, if you don't already have it, um, a direct link to the Ohio chapters um, website as well. You can go on to the next one. And um, so they didn't make it into the slides, but Z also wanted to share a handful um, of events as well. And I'm gonna start throwing them in the chat. So right here um, is your walk and bike to school. Um, upcoming, there's a Safe Routes partnership that has a building communities and how to use federal funds to connect people, places, opportunities 
and each other. Um, they have a webinar coming up um, on the 18th of this month, which you'll see momentarily in your chat. Um, also, it is Walktober um, through the APA. And so Maryland has a series of webinars they're calling Walkinars um, that are coming up throughout this month that I'll also put in the chat. The first one is coming up, um, well, today, it is the sixth, um, but then every Thursday um, for the rest of the month, you can find those going on. And then the last one I'm gonna go off the cuff on uh, is one from the National Center for Rural Road Safety. Um, they are really trying to hone in on um, bringing a, a full line of knowledge and equipping people across disciplines for safety and bringing that mindset and skills to that. Um, they have a number of different webinars that again, start today and that run um, through November. And you can find information on that right here. Um, and I do believe that is all for me for the whole meeting. Do you have any questions? I'll take them at this time. Okay, any questions for Allison? Okay, remind everyone check the chat. There's a, a, a lot of links posted there. We'll just add them to Allison just discussed. Okay, uh, item that brings us to item 10. Any other non action items of interest to the committee? Hi, Steve. This is Aspen again. I have just another update about the SUDAS changes that I discussed with you all last month. Um, so again, the Bike Ped Roundtable reviewed these proposed changes to the SUDAS manual regarding complete streets, um, and they are just now presenting um, later this month uh, to their District 1 folks. And again, the proposed changes are in the following chapters here. Um, in the bike ped roundtable, put together a list of additional questions, considerations for the board to consider, because we thought October was when these changes were going to be finalized. Um, next slide. Um, but after talking with some folks, it turns out October is actually the first time that they're actually presenting these to the SUDOS board. So um, in October will just be the first conversation. And then October through February, um, the SUDOS board will be meeting with all city, county, DOT, and consulting engineers um, around the state to get additional feedback. So if you weren't able to review the proposed changes, um, don't worry, they will probably be reaching out to you in the coming months. And then in February, um, at their next district, all district meeting, um, they'll discuss the sort of second iteration of those proposed changes after incorporating all that feedback. And then in April, discuss it again. And then May of next year will be the final vote on what those changes are. So um, in the meeting follow-up notes, I will go ahead and include what the bike ped roundtable put together, um, maybe to use as a starting point um, for your discussions with them. Um, but this is not something that we are presenting to the SUDAS board from the MPO, but rather just things that the bike ped roundtable um, thought we should take a closer look at. Um, but if you have any questions about those additional specifications uh, we had questions about, you can certainly reach out to me or whoever your bike ped round table um, representative is. So something to look forward to in the next uh, couple of months. And hopefully you can tie into maybe some of those meetings going forward. Okay, uh, so we have a question from uh, uh, hand raised, John Davis. Yeah, uh, Steve, it's not a question. It's more of a comment about an upcoming event. Yeah. So if anyone has any questions on what Aspen okay. just presented, I'll, I'll yield to them. Okay. All right. uh, any questions uh, for Aspen uh, or, or discussion on, on the SUDAS updates? Okay. Here you go. Thank you, Aspen. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks. All right. Uh, John, you said you had an announcement? Yes. Yeah, just a reminder for everyone that uh, the uh, Iowa Traffic and Safety Forum will be held on the 16th of November up in Ames at the Gateway Hotel and Conference Center. And the day before on the 15th is the Iowa section ITE uh, meeting that will be held at the uh, Gateway Hotel and Conference Center uh, as well. So as, uh, those of us in the metro area probably would come up for each day. But if you have any friends or uh, colleagues that are in the outlying areas, they can certainly stay overnight and uh, get uh, uh, two conferences for, uh, for really the price of one. Uh, so uh, more information will be 
sent out uh, for the Iowa section coming up in the uh, probably the coming weeks. Thank you. I went ahead and put a link in the chat for that event that John just discussed. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. All right. Any other non action items of interest to the committee? Okay, hearing none, our next meeting date is November 3rd, 2022, at 9 30, our usual time at 9 30 in the morning. Uh, we'll consider this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.